You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are watching and listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's June 14th, 2021. Well, you know about the commodities bull market that's taking place, lumber quadrupling or more, copper up to new all-time record highs, and so many other, other vital materials, agricultural commodities, you name it. One thing you haven't heard about going up to new highs even close to it, is uranium. And if you're not familiar, well, U308, you got to have it if you want to produce nuclear power. And nuclear power is expanding across the globe, even in the United States. Well, they're busy decommissioning plants, but at some point they'll be building new ones, no doubt, especially with the new technology out there. So we thought uh, for your purposes, you want to find out more about uranium, we would get Justin Hewn on with us. And his newsletter is uraniuminsider.com. And Justin, it's great to have you on the show. We haven't really talked before. Uh, you're making a very bullish case for uranium, aren't you? Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, Kerry. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really starting to turn positive on all metrics. Um, we we believe that we're in the the early stages of what's likely to be a multi year bull market for uranium. And uh, do you think we're ever going to see a parabolic move like we have in lumber and in uh, in other commodities? You know, if you had asked me this six months ago, I probably would have said it's more likely to be a slow and steady rise of the commodity that's based primarily on supply demand fundamentals and the nuclear uh, nuclear utilities coming back into the long term contracting market. But with recent developments of Sprott taking over management of Uranium Participation Corporation, which is kind of the primary um, U308 physical fund in the space, I think that it's increasingly likely that we could see a price spike scenario. I think so. What kind of spike do you think we'll see? It's hard to tell. I mean, to be conservative about it, the price of U308 currently is $32.50 roughly. And we need that price basically to double in order to incentivize all of the projects in the world that are on care and maintenance, which would be MacArthur River, Camago's MacArthur River, that's currently on care and maintenance and has been since 2018. They don't need quite that high of prices, but that would help. And then we have Paladin's Langer Heinrich, which is another big mine in Namibia. We need prices at least in the mid to high 50s there. So we usually say 60s to kind of get everything back online that's paused to get us to a roughly balanced market. But what we have is nuclear utilities um, uncovered with term contract deliveries substantially when we look at the period, you know, 2025 and beyond. So that quote unquote balanced market from a couple of these large care and maintenance mines coming back online is somewhat irrelevant when it comes to future demand. But, you know, long story short, that we need the prices to double is just the beginning because now what we have is financial players essentially controlling the spot market. And the way that the Sprott entity is going to work, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust is that they're going to have a New York Stock Exchange listing and they're going to have an ATM financing vehicle. So as money flows into the stock, they'll be able to immediately purchase physical uranium on the spot market. And what they're going to be doing is forcing a short-term delivery, you know, 30, maybe 60 day delivery time. Whereas right now, spot price is driven by deliveries of 12 months or less. So we're going to have for the first time in a very long time, if not ever, consistent front month bids in the spot market. And I mean, I, I really don't like to say such blindly bullish things as the sky's the limit, but I really don't know where the price could go on this. I mean, it spiked to 100 and what was it, $134 in 2007. I think we could easily go back to that range, if not higher. Although those prices are not needed for anything fundamental in the nuclear energy sector, that would simply be speculating by financial players in the investing world. Okay, so yeah, like really the cost of uranium as far as powering a 
uh, a uranium uh, power plant, you know, a nuclear power plant, it's a really relatively small cost, isn't it? So it's not real demand uh, price sensitive, shall we say? It's true. Um, although, although there is some nuance to that, you know, there's deregulated markets in the U.S. where they actually have to compete on energy prices with natural gas, um, solar, wind, etc. And um, so there's there's a bit of a nuance there. And also, price of U308 relative to overall operating costs is, is really small. You know, four percent or less than that of their total operating costs. But you know, the price of U308 is not doesn't exist in a vacuum. You also have prices of conversion and enrichment that generally will rise, a lot, you know, and not necessarily in lockstep, but along with rising U308 prices. And we actually have the cost of conversion at near an all time high, and the cost of enrichment is also going up and has been for the last two years. So while generally speaking, these plants will continue to operate in a rising price environment, it could get to a point where we get prices high enough to where nuclear utilities have to have um, supplemental funds coming in, perhaps from government agencies to, to support the plants running with in, like drastically increased fuel costs. Yeah, and a lot of times uh, they're able to pass these costs on to the consumer most, yes, uh, because their rates are regulated at the state level for the most part. And uh, there are basically because they're a utility, a monopoly, they have a guaranteed uh, return. It's basically a cost plus structure. Uh, maybe they won't let them get back all their costs, but over time they get back all their costs. True. So when you see like a Cuomo in New York shutting down Indian Point, which is, in my opinion, an act of complete insanity because uh, you're going to be on your bicycle in your backyard generating electricity for your house, or you'll be plugging in your new Ford F-150 to run the electricity in your house because there isn't going to be any, you know, coming in uh, over the wires. Yeah, that was really, really a, a, a sad thing to witness in New York with that plant shutting down. They immediately just, you know, said how they were going to have to be buying exported energy from from surrounding areas to to make up for that. And, you know, of course, some of that energy is going to be coming from fossil fuels. And a lot of these, you know, they had a a lot of pressure from the environmental lobby to close that plant primarily due to concerns about the river that it was adjacent to and this was going on for decades but what most people don't understand is that much of the environmental lobby that's been against nuclear power has been funded by fossil fuel lobbies so anytime a power a nuclear power plant closes down because it's baseload power it's not like solar and wind can just pick up the pieces you know, you have to have a baseload source of power to to make up for the loss of baseload energy. So always you have gas and or coal and or oil power coming in to replace that. Yeah, there's really no choice. And I lived 15 miles as the crow flies from Indian Point power plant in New York. You know, I wasn't overly thrilled about it because they didn't have the best uh, safety record. But overall, nuclear power extremely safe, reliable, and more importantly, 20% of New York City's total power came from Indian Point that they now have to make up and they won't let them build a pipeline for more natural gas. They won't let them frack where the, they're in the Marcellus Shell Formation right by Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's had a veritable windfall, Ohio, a complete windfall from fracking gas. There's nothing wrong with fracking gas environmentally, any other way. It's totally safe. And especially with new best practices in place. And yet New York, they just want to uh, have brownouts and blackouts, much like your state of California. They seem to take some. Don't just survive. Thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Today's show is brought to you by Mistango River Resources. Their flagship projects are located in Kirkland Lake, an established gold camp that has historically produced over 70 million ounces of gold. The Kirkland West project is a high-grade gold project beside Kirkland Lake Gold's world-class Mikasa Gold Mine, one of the highest-grade mines in the world. The major project is an advanced stage project with 600,000-plus ounces of gold along the Cadillac Break, 25 kilometers 
kilometers east of Mikasa. Their projects have the potential to transform into another world-class mining camp in the Kirkland Lake District. Make sure you go over to mistango.com, that's M-I-S-T-A-N-G-O.com, take a look and sign up for notifications. Stock is traded on the Canadian Stock Exchange, ticker symbol M-I-S. For more information and to sign up for notifications, go to mistango.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Yeah, it's a mess. And, and of course, in California, they're wanting to, to close Diablo Canyon in the next couple of years. And we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, fortunately, the governor is, is hopefully on his way out as of uh, the end of this year with the recall election. So we'll see how that goes. If he's replaced and we get somebody in there who has a, a bit more sense when it comes to clean energy, looking at the numbers with a logical perspective rather than a, a, a feelings perspective, then I think that there's a chance it could stay online, although it is California, so I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, California and common sense uh, kind of don't really uh, go together, do they? Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> is why people are leaving the state in droves. But uh, we digress a little bit, but that's okay. But looking at it in terms of uranium's future, uh, China, other countries around the world, all investing in nuclear, and that's going to eventually transmit, translate into demand for U308, for fuel, for reprocessing, for storage, all these factors. And really, uh, the new generation of power plants, which we haven't seen much of in this country, are pretty much as safe and foolproof, idiot-proof as they can possibly be. But of course, their dumbed-down populace doesn't really understand that, do they? Yeah, it's most people don't know this, but nuclear energy, in terms of, of kilowatt hour produced per uh, human life, as far as like deaths per, per kilowatt hour produced, nuclear energy is the safest form of energy that's ever been produced. It's unbelievably safe. And um, with the exception of Chernobyl, which was actually a bad accident, and there, there are zero power plants with that design running in the world right now. So the, the likelihood of something like that, I mean, it, Chernobyl did not have a containment a containment structure. So that's, there are no power plants running currently that don't have containment structures. And after uh, Fukushima, which resulted in zero deaths, um, you know, power plant operators worldwide went through pretty stringent safety, uh, safety regulation improvements. And so it's, it's a very safe, relatively speaking, a very safe uh, means of producing energy. And, and you're right about the advanced nuclear reactors that are currently being built and being proposed, including what are referred to as SMRs or small modular reactors. There's SMR designs where um, you use slightly high, more highly enriched uranium, but it's uranium, the uranium fuel for these reactors won't have to be refueled for 20 years, potentially. They produced almost no waste at all. Some of them are even working on, on technologies where the waste can be reprocessed. They're essentially meltdown proof. And uh, of course, uh, zero carbon, uh, there's no emissions correlated with this type of energy production. So it's it's really a no-brainer when it comes to clean energy future. And what we're seeing right now, not only in the United States, but around the world, is that there's an increasing embracing of nuclear right now. And to the extent that there is this alarmism around climate change and around carbon emissions, that nuclear energy is literally the answer to, to the problem of carbon emissions. So what we're seeing is even the quote unquote environmental left starting to accept nuclear as a viable option for, for green energy going forward. And that's quite, that's quite a sea change, even from 12, 24 months ago. I, I couldn't have expected that. Oh, well, and we can debate uh, natural gas, which is the cleanest uh, fossil fuel imaginable, uh, very safe. And we're exporting it all over the world. The U.S. has the cheapest, uh, cheapest, lowest cost sources of natural gas. We've got a glut of it. The rest of the world has a shortage uh, that they're relying upon Russia, pretty much, at least Europe and Asia, to fulfill. and. Really, uh, we shouldn't be so quick to be closing them down or foreclosing the option of natural gas. Plus, it cooks better than anything else out there and heats better than electric. And uh, 
and is much more efficient than electric. But uh, nobody, uh, nobody bothers with the facts. Doesn't matter. Uh, but I find it interesting, though, that the left, the uh, environmental left, is starting to embrace nuclear power. I didn't think I'd ever live to see that. Yeah, it's it's really interesting to see that. Um, in, in fact, one of the biggest advocates of nuclear right now is the Democrat senator of West Virginia, uh, Joe Manchin, and he's he's really pounding the table, and he's been a, a large influence to the the the, the Biden administration's um, um, you know the energy energy department essentially being in support of nuclear, and so I. I don't think we're going to see a renaissance of new builds in the United States, but hey, I'd love to be surprised. But at the very least, what we should see is increasing support for the existing reactors to um, get life extensions and continue operating. Hey, and maybe we won't. Well, we could very well see where places like New York have this disaster happen in California and the plants that can be built the quickest are these uh, these smaller, low cost nuclear plants because they're basically prefabbed and they don't need all that site work the way they used to and as many uh, fail safes. So, you know, you could conceivably get one built in a matter of several years if the permit process was expedited because they can just bang them out. Right. Unlike in the past where the old nuclear power plants, you see, everyone was a custom job. Every unit was custom built. And, and that's part of the reason that added to the cost and to their, uh, you know, the obstacles to building them because the cost overruns would immediately fly out of control when you built a new nuclear power plant back in the day, right? For sure, yeah. And especially in a place like the United States um, and, and in Britain as well, they're seeing similar, uh, you know, extensions on the on the timeframes and the budget for, for the, the power plants that are being built there. Um, you know, China is knocking them out on time on budget and they're, they're, you know, there's 54 reactors being built worldwide right now, currently under construction. Um, a bulk of them are in China and there's, you know, over 400 that are planned and proposed, but, um, yeah, I absolutely agree. The small modular reactors have the potential to completely change the game. Um, you know, that's a little bit farther down the road. We don't actually see that highly influencing the current bull market. And this, let's call it speculation in uranium that we expect to be, you know, two to four or five years, maybe, but it could be longer. But um, it definitely underlies the, the growing, let's say, fundamental support and support for nuclear energy. And to see this, this new advanced nuclear reactor technology coming forward that's, that's safe and reliable and meltdown proof and, and, and modular and much smaller, you know, these, these smaller reactors will be able to plug into to much smaller grids. So it doesn't make sense to build a 10, 20 billion dollar, 10 plus year project for a, a really tiny grid in, in in Africa or in South America or wherever it might be. Um, it makes sense to just bust out, you know, a factory built modular reactor that can that can be plug and play into a smaller grid. So it's an exciting development for sure. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing uh to seeing that move forward, especially now the uh the newfound uh <laughs> The newfound religion on the left, for lack of a better term. And uh, hey, so we really do appreciate you coming on, Justin. Just tell us how we find you, how we connect with you on the web. Yeah, thanks, Kerry, for having me. Um, I, I can be found at uraniuminsider.com. I have a pretty active presence on Twitter at Uranium Insider. If anybody has any questions about the uranium trade in general or about our newsletter, feel free to hit me up. All right. Excellent. And uh, if you've got any questions for Justin, myself, the email address is kl at kerrylutz.com. I will forward them off to Justin for you, promise. And uh, if you haven't done it already, please go over to financialsurvivalnetwork.com and sign up for our free newsletter. Justin, been a pleasure having you on. Appreciate it. Good luck with the publication. We'll have a link in the show notes so you can take a look at that. And we will talk to you again real soon. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.